Okay, so here's the second part of my thoughts on King Lear, and in particular Act 3, a little bit of Act 2 and Act 4 as well. I'm really, I kind of want to focus on Edgar, because he seems to be a, a witness to something that, that others don't voice, even if they are affected by it, they don't voice it as well as Edgar does. And so, taking us back to the problem of the storm in the hovel where everyone's crazy. Let's go back there in Act 3, in particular, where, where King Lear goes mad and uh, is surrounded by the fool and Edgar as poor Tom. And there's a real question about Edgar at that point, because he um, we don't know really whether this is like Hamlet, whether this is an antic disposition or, or what. You may have your questions about it. You may have your, your suspicions about it as well. But uh, all of this, we can, let's, let's try to review this, look at this scene under the problem of hubris. Wh who are you if you, if you are... Um, if, if you're hubristic. And what does it mean? What does hubris mean? Um, I suppose we could say here that that Lear has fallen from grace into madness. And simultaneously, I think we could also say that this is the effect of hubris. This is, this is the eventual reality that hubris brings about, is a kind of madness. But, but what is hubris exactly? We, I think it's easy enough to just say that this is what pride brings about. But, but hubris isn't exactly just pride, where, where one considers oneself great, or perhaps the center of everything. And uh, I, I suppose... Um, the understanding of it is that it's overweening pride. And uh, to understand as a tragic element that, that the tragic hero has to, has to encounter this, this problem, um, that overweening, that phrase overweening seems almost to contradict the element of pride. And the reason why I say that is that, that pride we understand to be one, the, the, when one elevates oneself to the most important thing. You, you worship yourself, right? You see yourself as the highest, highest importance, the highest good, one's own self. Um, the fact that it's overweening, however, suggests that it's so. That word overweening means that it's uh, it's almost like um, it's that, that word wean in that sense is kind of related to the word wish, and it has to do with desire. So it's it's like one's desire for oneself is over. It's beyond. It's super abundant. That word superflux that that Lear uses which he transposes or transfers from himself to the poor wretches. He begins to think of the poor wretches. But it's a superflux of, of desire for oneself or, or for the preeminence of oneself. One can't help but think of oneself. One can't help but reorder all of their reality around themselves. And they're driven to by their desire to do it. So much so that they're blind to reality. And so I, I think the reason why I, I refer to it as a contradiction or, or perhaps a, maybe a paradox or, is that for it to be overweening um, suggests that there's a sort of divine influence to it. That this pride, this centering, this self-centeredness, um, which probably was brought about and, and maybe even um, 
maybe even proven by a sort of rational process. I'm smarter than everyone. I'm stronger than everyone. I have more authority than everyone. In these situations, they all turn to me. And so by rationality, the self is, is centered, is made the center of things. And so it all makes sense. But then the overweening aspect is sort of like that divine madness. Like, like, like the gods come in and make it excessive in order to bring about some new thing so that it spills over and destroys itself. And so eventually the, the tragic hero really is supposed to see that he, he's not. Even despite that overweening aspect, he's not the center of things. And, and, and that this is an unaccountable loss to find this out. That one being at the center of one's own life is not reality. And, and it's, a, it's a sadness. It's a, it's, a, um, it's a mournful thing to have to find that out. And so uh, we see that with King Lear, who has to, has to violently lose everything in order to, to come to this realization, but it doesn't come the way one would hope. Edgar, however, also has a sort of similar realization where he has to dispense with himself, but he's quick to do it. And, and I wonder what the motives of it are. It's not like Hamlet... Who, who verbally says, in order to achieve my ends, I will put on an antic disposition. I, I will do this in order to effect an end. Uh, for Edgar, it, it seems more like it's an overweening thing. So let me read that portion. It's back in Act 2, um, Scene 3. And it's just the whole scene where Edgar's been chased by his, uh, by Gloucester, his father, and has happened to escape. He's happened to escape miraculously. And so he says here, Act 2, Scene 3, I heard myself proclaimed, and by the happy hollow of a tree escaped the hunt. No port is free, no place that guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. Whilst I may escape, I will preserve myself, and am bethought to take the basest and most poorest shape that ever penury and contempt of man brought near to beast. <laughs> <laughs>